Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At the moment, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those that are connected by telephone and require operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. For those online that require assistance, please use the chat box on your screen. I would like to now hand the meeting over to your host, Tanya McDonald, Program Director at the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead. Thank you. So hello and welcome to everyone to our fifth webinar in our series, Next Steps in COVID-19 Response in Long-Term Care and Retirement Homes. Uh, the focus of today's discussion will be on uh, pandemic response and surge capacity. I will be moderating this session from my home office in Ottawa, Ontario. I would like to acknowledge that my home office in Ottawa is on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. I would also like to pay my respects to all Indigenous people in this uh, region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We are pleased to host our webinar in both official languages. Uh, the telephone number to connect to the French audio is on the screen, uh, and we invite you to use either official language when uh, asking your questions or putting comments in the chat box. So I'm pleased to present our three speakers for today's webinar. Gail Sutton, South Lake Director of Community Programs and Partnerships. Gail is an experienced healthcare leader with a track record for driving innovation and using evidence-based methods to achieve ambitious results. Gail is, uh, successfully navigates our complex health land, healthcare landscape with innovative programs to improve patient and provider experience, health, health outcomes, and health system effectiveness. During South Lake's management of River Glen Haven, Gail is the executive lead to get the home out of out outbreak status. Jocelyn Verity, South Lake Str Strategy Manager. Jocelyn's an experienced strategic project manager and leader in multiple healthcare sectors. She provides strategic uh, leadership and guidance to South Lake Community Ontario Health Team, working across health providers in the community to design and implement integrated care models. During South Lake's management of River Glen Haven, Jocelyn was the liaison officer integrating the project team with River Glen Haven, its community, and other health system partners. Jordan Kanampuza, ATK, ATK Care Group Chief Operating Officer. ATK Care Group operates three long-term care homes and one retirement home in Ontario. Jordan successfully manages 298 employees and operates 205 long-term care beds and 67 retirement beds in the province. So today's session is focused on learning from South Lake Regional Health Center's experience on pandemic response and surge capacity. We aim to offer concrete strategies to organizations related to pandemic response and surge capacity, and also share program updates and next steps to participate in the Long-Term Care Plus acting on pandemic learning together. The Long-Term Care Plus program is based on a, a report that was published in July 2020 by the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, based on interviews with uh, more than 40 uh, family partners in care, healthcare leaders, and policymakers across the country. It focuses on promising practices in six key areas that have the potential to reduce the risk of COVID, future COVID-19 outbreaks or mitigate their effects. Uh, the six promising theme areas include preparation, prevention, people in the workforce, pandemic response and surge capacity, which is the focus of today's webinar, planning for COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 care, and presence of family. So to a deeper dive into what exactly uh, pandemic response and surge capacity looks like in our report, so the questions that it addresses are, do homes have formal, clear, well-communicated well plans of where they will turn to for assistance if there is an outbreak? Is there a pre-agreed plan for surge support for every home, if needed, that will ensure a robust response? Are surveillance methods in place, for example, data dashboards, to proactively identify where surge capacity is needed? And how will homes reduce the risk of cross-infection in the case of an outbreak involving residents, for example, testing before cohorting residents who are, uh, who are not affected? So without further ado, I will pass over uh, the present. Oh, and we can't, of course, do this collectively without our partners. So we have many partners who are involved in this program with us, including BC Patient Safety Quality Council, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, the New Brunswick Association of Nursing Homes, CADIF, uh, the CMA Foundation, and uh, the Manitoba Institute for Patient Safety. So we are very happy to provide this program uh, in partnership with our value partners from across the country. 
And without further ado, I will pass over the microphone uh, to Gail and Jocelyn to share their experience. Hi there, it's Gail Sutton speaking, and thank you very much for inviting our team, both South Lake and our partners from River Glen Haven, to this presentation. Um, if I can just ask if you could go to the next slide. We won't be moving our slides forward. We're going to have that done for us. Um, and what you're going to hear through this presentation is I'm going to provide some context to um, the location of this long-term care home, a little bit of the work we did, and then Jocelyn is going to provide a lot of information regarding how we linked our strategy to measurement and the mechanism. And our partner, uh, Jordan, is going to speak to what we learned together. So when you're looking at the setting, I think it's important to recognize slides just went dark. Um, it is important to recognize that this outbreak took place in wave one. And um, at that time, I think we're frozen. Can you hear us OK on the line? Yes, we can hear you uh, very well. Gail. Okay, so just the confuse. Sorry, just the slides. I love technology. It gets confusing at times. So on April 27th, um, the outbreak uh, was declared at River Glen Haven. River Glen Haven is a larger long-term care home that is located in a uh, community north of Newmarket. It's more of a rural community. It is one of the larger employers in the community, and it's also a very, very important element of the thread of the community. As you can see, um, some numbers on the outbreak when we arrived was that the home had been in outbreak for 66 days. There had been 36 deaths of residents. There were 90 residents who had become infected, and there was 37 staff. So moving on to um, our next, um, that's sort of the context for how we arrived there. The Ministry of Long-Term Care put in an involuntary uh, mandatory order and that brought um, River Glen Haven staff and South Lake and the Ministry working together in a new way. May I have the next slide, please? There we go. So, when we partnered, we came together and uh, jointly decided there were five areas we needed to focus on. For anyone who's worked through the pandemic work, you will know this is not new. Infection prevention and control, resident care, PPE supplies, having a strong management team, and family engagement. I think one of the things we need to remember that during wave one, a lot of efforts and energies had been focused on preparing the hospital sector. And sometimes other sectors, such as the long-term care sector, um, felt that they were facing a few barriers when it came to things like accessing PPE, et cetera, um, perhaps uh, having good P, uh, infection control processes. And the other thing is, because this is long-term care, these are residents who are living in their home. What we really found when we uh, started working with River Glen is the staff were very passionate about making sure the residents were receiving the care they needed. And were feeling a little bit exhausted because a number of them had been off sick. And they were also worried what was going to happen to their residents what was, and what was going to happen to them. So if we can move on to the next slide, I'll explain the, the approach we took. Basically what we took is an approach that said, we will show you how to do this, we will coach you by your side, and then we will stand back and support you as you learn to take on these new tasks. And again, I would remind everybody that during wave one, almost every day there was new information about how to manage a pandemic, what COVID was, how to treat people who had it, all of the issues about working isolation and that were quite different. So for example, by lead by example, we had our IPAC extenders from South Lake, the Lynn and from Public Health come on site and refresh the education that had been received. And also because in wave one, there's a lot of different information that the staff were saying. So one of the key things we needed to do is say, this is how we don and doff, 
and everyone's going to do it the same way versus um, having a number of different pieces of information that were confusing for people. If you look at PPE supplies, actually River Glen Haven had a, quite a number of PPE supplies, but what they had not had an opportunity, it was to create an inventory and a burn rate. So that was one of the ways that we could do that. Uh, the home noticed that while they were looking at the burn rate that the use of gowns was very high and made an informed decision to switch to be using uh, re reusable versus disposable gowns because they had the laundry system on place. And that really helped um, making sure that there was PPE there that was critical in a timely way. And it also uh, was looking at building for the future in wave two. There would always be the gowns that were needed there. If we're looking at stabilization and then again into PPE, again, having our expenders come out and then the home started, if we carry that through into uh, goal number three, the home adopted being able to do their own audits and they actually went in with an electronic audit process and today they're doing multiple audits at every shift. Um, and I would flag for people who may not have been through this, one of the key things you need to remember is that many times we focus our efforts during the daylight hours or the day shifts or the weekday shifts. And it is equally as critical that we focus our efforts on the night shifts and the evening shifts. Because frequently there's less people around, the residents still need all the same level of care, and sometimes our educational efforts have not been perhaps as robust with the evening and night shifts as they were with the day shift. If we're looking at this again with family uh, town halls, in the beginning, uh, we all recognized how important it was to have these town halls. As you'll recall in Ontario, families couldn't come into the homes and visit. Um, the way River Glen Haven is physically structured, there's very few rooms that you can actually stand outside and be able to look through to the residents' rooms. So families were concerned. And here, again, we led by example, being able to hold town hall meetings, being able to uh, produce daily updates. And then we started to work with the home in phase two about what are the things that are going to be important in phase two to the home. In phase three, the home actually took over um, and are doing those daily updates and continue to do that to this day. If we move on to the next slide, obviously what's important in this situation is really understanding how to build a, a coalition of the willing, acknowledging that we as South Lake did not have all the answers. River Glen staff didn't have any of the have all of the answers. But our opportunity was really to partner together. And each day we set what our goals of the day were and everybody went out on the same page. At the end of the week on Friday's management huddle, we actually celebrated all the successes of the week. Um, and I'm really, really proud to announce that that's actually something under Jordan's leadership that has continued in the home. Um, a couple of other things was, um, there's different ways to go and work as a partnership. South Lake, in consultation with the team at RGH, um, decided that it would be better to have a very small, dedicated team from South Lake that was working right by their sides versus having a larger group of people who would show up and then um, move out of, of the environment. Um, it was felt to kind of have build those relationships, get to know one another, understand everyone's perspectives, and also recognize how we're all trying to work together for the same goal. So things that are there about introducing the daily management huddles. Also the thing with making sure communication. As I said in the beginning, this is a relatively larger home. It's three floors. Uh, and there's one floor for people with very advanced states of dementia and responsive behaviors. So making sure that daily we were having those conversations, not only at the management huddle, but there was a huddle with each one of the units, and that that was happening on all shifts was really, really critical. I know um, the next piece that I would like to speak to a little bit more, because we've talked about what we found, how we worked together, how we built our coalition, and moving on to our next 
um, slide is about the importance of working with families. One slide back, please. Oh, sorry. Me now. I think so what I'm going to ask Jocelyn to do right now is if we could move to the next side of what getting measured. Because what's really important as we build all these structures is we actually had the mechanisms underneath to drive to our goals and make sure that we were achieving those. Hi everyone, so I'm going to talk about sort of the importance of measurement and Gail's teased this a little bit already in terms of sort of the importance of data to help it sort of set our collective goals and help kind of keep our focus. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we went about this um, and some of the actual tools that we developed and used together. Um, so the first one in terms of the first phase when we arrived on site and we started working together is around tracking the outbreak. So there's a lot of data that needs to be collected during the outbreak um, and there's a lot of different people that are looking at that data. So that includes public health, it includes the management team at River Glen, it included our team, it also included the ministry. And the other audience, which I think you should never sort of forget about, and I'm going to talk about it again on the next slide, is the family as well because the families are also looking at this data. So it's really important that you've got um, consistent data that's been, that everybody's on the same page, that everybody knows sort of what those numbers are that are being tracked, so that you can actually take the focus, instead of kind of validating the numbers, what you want to do is take that information so that you can then use it in a meaningful way so that you can be acting on that data. So what we really quickly worked together to do is working really closely, especially with the, the management team at RGH, we look to sort of revamp that daily tracking tool that we were using to capture the data during the outbreak phase. And so this was a tool that's very small. You can't see sort of the details, but it had some color. It had very clear measures that we were tracking. And actually behind each of those sections for the data, and that's actually kind of a calendar view of all of the different days, there was a subsequent tab where we actually went a little bit deeper in terms of capturing data around sort of staffing and the staffing numbers around sort of the number of touch points of, you know, cleaning for high touch services. So there was a lot of data that we collected. And in the beginning, the, the calls we actually had it took about an hour to actually go through the data to make sure it was sort of being completed correctly. Um, I would say within pretty quickly, um, that hour-long call turned to about five minutes in terms of a quick check. It was really quick to complete. Um, everybody was on the same page of the, uh, in terms of what the data was, and we were really shifting to now what do we do about it. Here's what the data was, and let's action it. Um, so that was a really, it was an important first step in terms of us working together and really getting sort of a clear handle on the outbreak and the numbers associated with it. The other piece that I will mention, and I'm going to talk about it again in the next slide, is we did pull some of these key data points and also included it in a daily family communication because that was another sort of um, source of, I will say, unease in terms of that the family also wanted to know what the numbers were and it wasn't necessarily helpful if they were going out and getting that data from the, from the media, which may be reporting the correct numbers or not the correct numbers, or if it was coming from, say, the New York Region Public Health, in our case, um, their website. So it was important to make sure that we were all, all sort of talking the same in terms of the numbers. Um, now, once we sort of shifted out of the outbreak, we needed a different tool. So the, the daily outbreak tool, it had its place and it had its time. Um, and then we really shifted to working really closely, in particular with Jordan, around kind of how we were going to then transition, um, you know, step, our, for our team to step back and for the home to kind of come back in and sort of assume operations, the full operations of the home. And so we worked really closely with Jordan and his management team to develop a sustainability and a transition plan that included, again, we love tools, <laughs> a, a weekly in this case, it wasn't a daily, a weekly reporting tool. And we wanted to make sure that it was data that we felt was meaningful, that was important to track, as well as with some targets in terms of, run of 
we, we set targets in terms of how we would say, you know, this is where we want to be or this is a little bit off track in terms of kind of the yellow and green. So you'll see the tool down at the bottom is kind of, you can get a little bit of a look and feel for that tool in terms of how, how it's, um, what it looks like and how we used it. And that was really, it sort of helped us all to kind of keep focused in terms of what was important um, and what did we make, need to make sure that, you know, it wasn't just a moment in time when we put these practices in place, but they're actually continued on um, in terms of what the home is doing today. And under sort of Jordan's leadership, as Gail mentioned earlier, he kind of leads the production of this report um, and everybody looking at it together on a weekly basis. And the, I should also mention that the management team is very, very invested in this tool. Um, and it's a kind of a cumulative effort or a combined effort in terms of everyone collecting the data from their respective um, areas within the home. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So in terms of engaging and supporting families, this was a really important piece for us when we arrived on site. And, you know, pulling the data from the tools that I mentioned and sharing those back with families, um, that was one part of what we did. So we did do um, daily during the outbreak, so it was about a month. Um, time period, we did share a daily communication out with the families where we also, we, you know, we talked about the priorities and what was happening at the home, but we also shared some of that key data as well. Um, and then eventually once the home was out of outbreak, that transitioned into a weekly report where again we shared uh, key performance indicators of sort of some key stats of what's happening in the home, just to give families sort of some transparency and some trust in terms of things like, does the home have sufficient levels of PPE, uh, are the staffing levels appropriate, and then the third activity where we actually had a lot of questions and feedback from family, and I think we all recognize that that was a challenge, especially during the first wave of the pandemic, is around recreational activities um, for residents. So that's a third piece of data that we share just to help families know in terms of, you know, even if they can't get into the home in the same way that they were before, what's actually happening on the ground in terms of, um, in terms of recreation and supports for residents. Other things that we did to um, really focus on that family engagement and communications, we also established, uh, because families couldn't come into the homes at the time um, when the home was first in outbreak, uh, a nearby local emergency operations center that we called it, um, but it was a, we, we had some space at the local high school across the street where uh, we were actually invited families to come and meet with our team. Um, and have some one-on-one -on -one conversations to kind of have a full debrief and an interview so they could share their stories, we could hear their concerns, and try and make sure that what we were doing in terms of working with the home um, was really sort of addressing what those needs were. Um, so we were actually, in the first 30 days, we met with over 30 families um, and had those conversations. Either we had them, invited them to come meet us at the school, or we did them by phone or using Microsoft Teams so we could do that face-to-face. Um, other things that we did in terms of communicating with families, we, we had our CEO do a number of kind of regular touch, touch points with families. We also had regular town halls with the families. And then um, as we looked to kind of transition um, and hand that back over to the home, we worked really closely together, um, in particular with Jordan, to develop sort of a new weekly um, communication that's being maintained by, the, by, by Jordan and the team um, today. Um, and they do include sort of there's a message from Jordan as well as kind of reporting on some of that key data, like I mentioned. Um, so the little visuals that you see over on the right-hand side, you'll see kind of where I spent my summer <laughs> at the high school. Um, and you'll see also some of what that's sort of some of the tools that we use to communicate to families in terms of the um, the daily communication and then how it transitioned into the weekly communication. Um, and this was really well received by the families. I know that they really did appreciate it, um, and it was a good source of kind of truth where they could go um, instead of kind of going to see some of the messaging that was in the media or, or sort of other places so that we could sort of help put people at ease and give them some sort of sense of what was happening at the home. Um, so I'm going to go, um, if we go to the next slide, so I'm going to hand it over to Jordan, uh, and he's going to talk about um, lessons learned in terms of sort of what we all learned together uh, through, the, through this journey, um, mm -hmm. and he'll take us through the key points on this slide. So over to you, Jordan. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, so yes, I, as Jocelyn has said, uh, really I, I want to explain through these slides the valuable lessons we've learned through this pandemic and especially through our first outbreak. 
um, really on this slide we provide a summary of key operational items that really need to be implemented in every pandemic response plan. Um, so I'm just going to briefly just discuss the eight items um, on the slide. So the first being a thorough IPAC education and audit plan. So IPAC is truly essential and needs to be proactively reviewed and discussed with all staff, families, and residents. It is really the only way to contain the spread of COVID once it's entered your facility. At RGH, we've done a number of, of tasks. First, we have PPE champions, not only on every floor, but on every shift. These individuals are seen as mentors and coach our staff if they see any infractions or staff have any questions. Uh, we have a designated IPAC lead, who is our ADOC. She conducts daily and weekly audits on every floor looking for PPE infractions, as well as provides coaching. Finally, as Dale had mentioned, we have daily huddles with our staff, both in the morning and in the evening. And in these huddles, we discuss not only operational changes, but we reiterate IPAC, proper IPAC best practices. And we actually have practical training that we do with our staff just so they're maintaining best practices. So next, we have a quick deep clean and decluttering of the home. So since our outbreak, RGH has really made a strong focal point for families and residents to, to explain and really limit the number of non-essential items that residents have in their room. Um, this is primarily focused regarding eye packing cleaning purposes. Um, we have went through significant decluttering, and we have weekly walkthroughs of each room to ensure that clutter is minimized in, the home, in each room. In addition, RGH has doubled its housekeeping um, on a daily basis. Uh, we have deep cleaning done on each room at least twice monthly, and we have audits conducted to ensure high touch and deep cleaning are done. Third, so robust and nimble cohorting plan. Cohorting is essential for not only residents, but for staff. At RGH, we currently cohort our staff not only on every floor, but we also limit them per location to the number of residents that they care for. This really helps to mitigate and contain the spread if anything were to happen. Um, regarding our residents, we really developed a very comprehensive case-based scenario cohorting plan. Um, this plan has been reviewed thoroughly by the managers, by the staff, and we have on the huddle boards for our residents to see. So it really goes through just-in-case scenarios if you have a resident test positive, asymptomatic, what happens if you have one, two, three, et cetera. Um, just to ensure everyone knows what to do um, in any kind of case. So the fourth point is a comprehensive staffing plan. So as we all know, staffing has, and it continues to be, one of the most challenging factors in long-term care. With the new government directive limiting uh, the number of residents in a room to two people, um, RGH has actually um, reduced capacity to, to only having 77 residents or 41 less uh, beds. However, we are maintaining staffing levels as if we we're at full capacity. Doing this, it just it helps to ensure if anything were to help happen and if we were to go in an outbreak situation, we have enough staff in the home to ensure care needs are met for our residents. The fifth point is a comprehensive PPE acquisition. Um, so as Gail had mentioned, establishing daily burn rates it is truly it's critical in knowing your PPE supply and management. Uh, we track this daily, whether in an outbreak or not in an outbreak situation. And it's very good to know as a surveillance mechanism to know if staff are using the hand sanitizer or PPE equipment uh, regularly, if you have equipment walking out of the building. Additionally, we make it a goal to have at least three and a half months of supply on hand in case anything were to happen. Um, the sixth point is what gets measured gets done. So we noticed through our outbreak accountability and assigning specific roles to managers and staff is, is, is truly pivotal to ensure think tasks are accomplished. So we developed a very comprehensive roles and responsibility pandemic plan that has been thoroughly discussed with our managers, with our staff, and again, our, in our, on our huddle boards so residents can see. Um, the seventh point is resident care. So during an outbreak situation, and before even a home gets in an outbreak situation, it needs to clearly message to staff what the essential care needs are that need to be met. This goes back into assigning roles and responsibilities for managers and staff. We noticed during our outbreak, resident weight uh, became a significant issue, and these were a strong focal point at the latter part of our outbreak, and they continue to be um, at this time, as well as engagement. Uh, social, uh, social engagement is, is truly important, 
and the importance of caregivers. So as, as Gail had mentioned, from the first outbreak to now, uh, the directives have, have changed and caregivers all are allowed in the home. Caregivers are truly essential in promoting and assisting residents. For long periods of time, residents are stuck, isolated in their rooms, and caregivers, just they offer that, that emotional support and well-being to really improve the resident's quality of life um, in that time. And finally, we have a comprehensive communication plan at keeping families and caregivers informed. So as, as Jocelyn and Gail had mentioned, family communication was, we'll say, a hindrance or a struggle at the beginning of our outbreak. We had a lot of managers go off, and the focus was just on our residents. Um, through the work we've done with South Lake, we have developed, as Jocelyn mentioned, a weekly newsletter that we sent to all families regarding any operational updates as well as key performance indicators. So these indicators include staffing levels we have in the home, uh, the number of activities residents get broken down between physical, social, and spiritual activities. Uh, we also give them great detail on the PPE we have in our home just to provide some comfort and security in families knowing what exactly is happening at Rivaglen. Finally, we also have developed a centralized family portal or email communication. Um, we noticed during the outbreak we had a number of families emailing all of our managers the same questions and managers replying to these, to these emails, which caused a lot of inefficiency and duplication. Um, and having this centralized portal really uh, explain to the families and um, establish uh, ensures clarity and efficiency if we were to ever get in an outbreak situation again. It is through these eight elements um, that they're critical and they need to be included in every pandemic response plan to best contain an outbreak and ensure communication um, is supported to all stakeholders. Thank you. We could go to the next slide now. At this time, um, we can take any questions that you may have. So great, thank you for that uh, excellent overview and lessons learned from uh, your support uh, for um, the long-term care facility. Um, so we do have some questions, so I will go back to the top of my list and perhaps I will start with uh, Gail and Jocelyn. Um, so when you talked about changing the PPE, um, from the burn rate. So we have a question from uh, Sophia Oroz from the Ontario CLRI. Did you find that improved knowledge of PPE use affected the burn rate yes. at River Glen Haven? Yes, you will notice that um, when people are using proper PPE, you will get a burn rate established very quickly. It usually takes about 72 hours of continual counts, and then you can measure from that that uh, based on the number of residents who are in the home, if any uh, uh, go out to hospital or pass away, you should see the equivalent drop in your PPE rate, uh, burn rate, and um, it's a great monitoring tool. And if you'll also notice that um, Jordan said they are continuing to use that PPE burn rate, just for example, things like hand sanitizer, mask use, that sort of thing, um, they have adopted that into their ongoing quality improvement initiatives to uh, have that uh, me sort of a proxy measure for whether people are doing um, things correctly. Great. And um, Jocelyn, the next question will be for you. Uh, people liked your data collection tools, <laughs> so are you able to share those uh, more broadly? <laughs> Yeah, let me. I'll follow up with Gail, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, we'll see. What, we'll see what we can do. Maybe there's a generic way. There's something. Maybe a template or something that we can share with folks, and we can work with you and team to uh, see what we can do. <laughs> Perfect. You know, everybody uh, loves data, right? <laughs> everyone loves data. <laughs> and your message was pretty powerful, Jordan. What you measure gets done. So uh, you've perhaps inspired people. Uh, so the next question I'll ask Gail first, and then uh, maybe Jordan, if you want to add. So Gail. Um, and now I just lost it, of course. So was there an increased use of chemical and physical restraints in the home during the first outbreak when uh, visitors were restricted? Uh, no, there actually wasn't. And if you take into consideration the population that River Glen Haven um, cares for, um, you would expect overall the use of restraints to be higher 
It wasn't. Um, we had um, our medical director did a complete review of all residents, and there was no additional use of chemical restraints. There are some residents who are on medications that could be assumed to be chemical restraints, but that's actually related to their psych psychiatric conditions uh, that pre-existed COVID. Um, what we did find, uh, frankly, when people are really sick with COVID, um, they don't move. Um, getting them to move is actually what you need to do. Um, what we did struggle with, and uh, I would welcome it up to your viewership if they have any answers, is that um, for people who have tactile hypersensitivity related to responsive behaviors, i.e. they like to touch things, um, they really like to touch PPE. So the original packets of PPE, um, you would watch thousands of dollars of PPE get um, contaminated very quickly as somebody went through and sorted and folded it. So uh, one, they changed the incomplete access to PPE uh, so that that didn't happen. And we also used other mechanisms such as um, folding towels and those types of things for the people who wanted to touch stuff. Um, I must say the staff did an absolutely heroic job of trying to keep everybody in their rooms, especially the wanderers and individuals that when you try to encourage them to stay in their room and they couldn't walk anymore um, in the hallways would, would become frustrated. So I recognize a very long answer, um, but we did not see an increase in uh, chemical or physical restraints. Uh, Jordan, if you're still there, I've lost your camera, but the same question if you have something to add from uh, Lisa Poole from Dementia Advocacy Canada around use of restraints. No, Jordan, I haven't you... covered that. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, Jordan, I have the next question is for you, um, and it is from uh, Jill uh, Oliver from William Osler Health System. So how did you handle uh, situations where residents would not agree to move uh, for cohorting purposes? Um, we, we didn't really actually have a struggle with that. Residents were very open to, to moving. Um, they understood the, the situation happening. Um, if, if residents um, struggled with it, we would talk to the POAs. Uh, but that, that wasn't really actually a challenge uh, we faced. Great. Um, the next question I'll uh, ask Gail. Um, so it is from Joanna Trimble from Patients for Patient Safety Canada. How have you accommodated family members who are essential care, care partners in, uh, in the care of their loved ones? And so she just gave an example in BC um, of a survey that came out that uh, demonstrated the detrimental effects of limiting those essential caregivers' access. Right. So um, one of the things is you needed to follow the directive. And in the first wave, we had very specific directives uh, that limited people coming into the home. As soon as the home was um, free of outbreak, and we knew those days were coming, we actually reached out to our family and said, frankly, we're all in this together. We know that you want to come in and visit your loved ones. We want you in here visiting your loved ones. But the only way that's going to happen is if we work together. And, you know, to be honest, we kind of formed a social contract. These are the things that the families need to do. This is what the home is going to do. Uh, and I know that not every facility has had the same experience as River Glen, but for the most part, our families have been extremely supportive, have been cooperative, um, and we've been able to we've been able to uh, make sure that the essential caregivers are in the homes. Uh, the other thing that's a little bit interesting about River Glen is there's a nurse practitioner-led clinic literally at the end of their driveway. And so to make sure that the essential visitors and other members of the community could access swabbing, they set up a, a remote assessment clinic to do the weekly swabbings and those types of things. Um, you know, the, the whole community really participated in this um, to make sure the essential caregivers could stay there. Um, we had donning and doffing stations set up. Uh, people followed the rules. We, uh, public health gave us nice big pictures that people could follow that perhaps um, English wasn't their first language, kind of pictograms. So overall, I, I think we've had a really um, 
that's been one of our strengths, actually, I would say, of River Glen. Great. Uh, the next question for Jordan uh, from Isha Ray Shaduri from Patients for uh, Patient Safe. Um, all seven points appear to be very good in terms of the efficiency, so I'm assuming we're referring to those points that you went through in the lessons learned. So what measures are there uh, for capturing context of minority families or residents? Ooh, so we, we I mean, the, I would say the resident population here at River Glen and, and the family uh, population here um, is, is not very, um, we'll say, diverse uh, in a setting. We, it's, it's primarily um, the same, the same culture, the same resident population. We make it very uh, clear in understanding to all residents and all families uh, what to do. If we do have a few individuals who, I will say, English is not the first language, uh, we've really made it a point when we have staff who. Uh, speak similar languages, that they are the ones communicating to families, so everyone's fully aware of, of what to do um, in specific situations, especially when it comes to essential caregivers uh, and the training required for the essential caregivers, the weekly testing. Um, we, we know uh, the language barrier is probably the, the, the most difficult thing we face here at Riverland when it comes to a few of our residents, and, and we ensure that we have um, some, some way of communicating to the families so they correctly are fully aware uh, of what they need to do um, so they can be in the home and visiting their residents. So thank you. So Gail, uh, a comment or a suggestion perhaps from Sophia from Ontario CLRI. Have you thought of looking into programs, software that are available to inform families of therapeutic recreation programs that their loved ones are involved with? Uh, an example is Activity Pro, and there are others, so just as a way uh, to enhance the communication. So um, I, I'm going to let Jordan speak to um, Activity Pro and some of those others. Um, one of the, the things that we recognized uh, was the importance of having activities with, um, with the residents. And just to go back to our phrase about what get measures get done, so there's actually a measurement system for each resident that shows not only the type of activity they had, the frequency of the activity, and the person involved. And that's available, the management staff in Jordan review that on a weekly basis, but also when the um, care conferences happen, that information is brought forward to the care conferences. And of course, with families, um, that would be shared. So for example, um, if you had a resident that was quite involved in their spiritual activities, and then um, people noted that they weren't doing as much, the uh, recreation nursing or perhaps even Jordan himself, would go in and, and, and understand where that resident is coming from, what, uh, what's happening with the change in the behaviors, and is it that they would like to pursue a different spiritual avenue, or is it that you know they couldn't get on to the Wi-Fi, or they just didn't like who was speaking that week. Or it could be other things. Um, also to that point, we had a lot of support from um, some of the community agencies that specialize in mental health, and they were offering a lot of virtual programs to both staff and residents through this. And just regarding the point of Activity Pro, it's actually something we are uh, beginning to implement here at River Glen. Um, it is a very useful to, tool um, that I think will help with efficiency and, and, and tracking of uh, activities compared to what we're doing at the moment. Great. And so Gail just built Oh, go ahead. I, go ahead, Jocelyn. I think I'm totally in support of everything that Gail and Jordan have said. One other thing that we did encourage, even kind of once we were out of outbreak and reflecting, is thinking about, you know, that, that there's many different roles in terms of the staff who can help support the recreation in the home, and it doesn't necessarily just need to be the recreation team. So I think when we reflect back and think about the, the experience of the residents in long-term care home, encouraging all the staff to support uh, making sure that the recreation activities are maintained and maybe stepping a little bit outside of what your normal role might be is really an important factor um, because it, anybody can turn on the music, anybody can take some of those extra moments and I think there's a lot of things that can be done more from kind of a, you know, a cross roles kind of um, perspective to make sure that that's supported um, even in terms of exercise and physical activity. So just a, just a thought for, for anybody that's going through it um, to think about there's different many different creative ways that you can increase the level of recreation in the home.
Great. So we have a question from Chris Rusher from BC Patient Safety Quality Council, um, just uh, building on that theme of mental health support. So how did you approach uh, the psychological PPE for, uh, for staff throughout the outbreak, which is uh, something we presented back in October? Right. So um, for the psychological um, aspect, we, there was an employee assistance program, and uh, we put uh, signs anywhere, everywhere, especially the back of bathroom doors, to remind people of that. We had a number of resources that were available every day at Huddle. Those were reviewed. And the other thing is there's um, specific places where people enter and exit the building or um, hit the time clocks. And so we just put a note above there that um, I won't get all the lines, but it basically says that congratulate yourself for what you accomplished today. Take a breath and let go of the things that did not go as you want. Um, there's a few more pieces in it, but it was basically a mental health checklist as people came in to start their day and more importantly as they were leaving. The other thing with um, River Glen, as, as the title suggests, is it actually has a lovely backyard place that overlooks the river. And so um, we worked to create spaces there. Maybe it wouldn't work today because it's minus whatever it is here in Ontario today. But in the summertime, we could create safe social distancing spaces where staff could go and just reflect and grab a, a moment. In addition to that, um, we recognized that the loss that happened with this home was really important to the, to the residents, and it was important to the staff. Um, and we didn't want to create like a monument. Um, the residents and staff were very clear on the families. They didn't want kind of like a monument to what happened. They wanted something healthier. So we actually created a garden that um, it is a garden that weaves in many different types of elements. It has some butterfly bushes. It has um, some statuary that was donated uh, related to other residents. It has some trees, and it's got this really nice little place that you can just go. There's a small plaque there to acknowledge the outbreak, um, but there's much more powerful and um, I would say kind of uh, refilling type of spaces that are available. The other thing is the community was very supportive. Um, you know, you would get people dropping off food, you would get people dropping off various different things. Um, there was a vigil that was held. Um, the community also was doing what it could to support staff. Jordan, did you want to add? No, um, as, as Gail did mention, um, our staff are truly extraordinarily passionate about our residents and to have the, the loss we did have in, in such, a, such a short amount of time, um, we really made it a focus uh, when it came to mental health and well-being um, to, to extend and make sure our EAP program was available to, to really all our staff, um, to really make sure they're fully aware of, of the programs, how to reach the programs, who to speak to, um, and really know that we're all in this together and we're all here to support one another. Uh, it, it was truly tough. It's still, it, it's an ongoing um, thing, but uh, just establishing that supportive environment and having those, those outreach tools really um, are important. Right. And I'll, I'll stay with you, Jordan, for the next question from Maylin Soong from Trillium Court. So how do you accommodate essential caregivers now in the event of, a, of another outbreak? So currently, um, with this one home being in the red zone, so we have essential caregivers who have to get weekly swabbing. Um, as Gail mentioned, we do have that MP-led clinic. Um, however, um, they have to get kind of government approval, which usually they're able to do once a month. Um, so currently, we, even in an outbreak situation, we, uh, we're very clear with our caregivers uh, when it comes to the training they need, showing, and, uh, showing um, that they've had a negative swab. Um, one thing that's truly important when it comes to caregivers, they can come in and out, yes, as much as they want, but it's regarding the PPE, and following those practices. We have very strict conversations with the caregivers uh, regarding uh, what the PPE training needs to be and even supervising sometimes at points. And if the caregivers are, are violating um, kind of wearing proper PPE, uh, it's very stern phone calls that uh, it's unacceptable and if you continue to do this, you won't be able to visit the home. 
And can you just clarify when that clinic was set up? So Zofia is asking from CLRI. So that was more done via the nurse practitioner-led clinic just because there's, there's not many testing supports around River Glen Haven. Uh, so the nurse practitioner-led clinic set this up just to support the community in general. Um, I believe it's been set up now for the last maybe two months, maybe two and a half months. Um, they do not, they're not able to provide the testing on a weekly basis, um, but it, it's been roughly about once a month they are able to uh, provide okay. uh, additional testing for our community. Great, thanks. So back to Gail and uh, Jocelyn, just continuing the conversation around safety measures for staff. Uh, are there any measures in place to monitor staff safety, including work workplace compensation board claims, uh, other measures uh, with respect to resident behaviors uh, and medication use and so on? Right. So there's all of those measures in place. Um, there's um, all of the issues that come um, with monitoring what's happening to staff, both um, the psychological and the physical elements of that. Um, so there are, as part of the outbreak, as everybody on the line will know from Ontario, you need to report to the Ministry of Labor uh, when you have these types of situations happening and all of that took place. Uh, when it comes to the resident behavior, um, if there is an interaction between staff and resident that um, is outside the norm, um, there's a process for that. There's a code uh, white process at the home. Um, but where, the, where River Glen has really focused its energies, um, and I believe it was doing this before the outbreak, but it certainly is since the outbreak, is really understanding dementia, understanding responsive behaviors. You know, right now um, it, it's very hard if you're a resident and you're having cognitive challenges and you've got somebody coming into your room wearing a mask, wearing a face shield, and then you're supposed to hear and interact with them. So, you know, there, there's been a lot of work done about just making sure you introduce yourself when you come into the room. You know, I'm Jose, I'm here to help you. You, you're in River Glen Haven, um, just always doing those orientation things and understanding where the residents are coming from. You know, sometimes some of the residents uh, need to have a little bit of support and there's one-on-one -on -one staff that are available with them who are also getting extra training and support so that they can support the residents through those difficult times. Great. And Jordan, I'm going to ask you the next question from Tazim. So just about surveillance testing for staff, um, can you share your experience, what worked and what didn't work well in that respect? Um, similarly, staff, I would say really educating the staff on the need for surveillance, uh, the benefits of it. We, we really established a, a strong culture here through the outbreak and, and even now um, that we all are in this together. and. The, the surveillance needed uh, of staff swabbing, especially now weekly staff swabbing, um, is essential. Um, staff are fully aware because it's a ministry directive that if you do not get swabbed within seven days, you're, you're not able to work at the facility. And not being able to work and not being able there to support your fellow staff members, um, it, it, staff don't want to do that. They want to support each other. Um, so they, they really bought into the weekly testing. Uh, us at the home, we've been very accommodating regarding uh, staff swabbing. Uh, we have two days now set up because uh, we are a larger facility to swab all our staff. Um, however, we are very accommodating as staff are not all are not all working those days uh, to swab them um, as needed uh, to ensure that they're getting swabbed um, as as often as, as they need to be. Um, so we've we've had significant buy-in from our staff. We're able to do the testing um, with our leadership team here, um, and, and it's, it's been very positive to be honest. Great. And maybe Jocelyn, uh, another question just around different ideas of activities, um, assuming that group activities were probably not permitted. So um, can you elaborate on some of the activities that you had in place for the residents? Oh yeah, 
uh, yeah, I'm just, Gail and I are just picking some highlights. So, um, you know, I think you have to be a little bit creative about how you do it. So I think, you know, if you think about exercise as an example, um, one of the things what, that they did in the home was to um, get the residents each kind of being, they're standing in their doorways and kind of making, being able to still while maintaining kind of that physical distancing, um, being able to participate in a, well, what, what seemed like, or you would have the feeling of it feeling like a group, uh, a group exercise. So I think when you know when I mentioned that you have to be a little bit more creative, especially um, uh, during these times, that was kind of one example of what we did. Um, we also made sure to use lots of music, um, and even like there's a lot of other things that we tried to do to kind of help um, increase increase that. The other thing we didn't mention it before, and I know it's no. Um, it absolutely doesn't replace that sort of um, physical contact with and visits with your family members, but we did put a really big emphasis, especially in the early days, on virtual visits with family members, um, and that was a measure that we tracked as well to make sure that we were not we were promoting it for anybody that it was appropriate for and for any families that did want to have um, virtual visits with their, um, with their loved ones to make sure that uh, that was being kind of maximized as much as possible. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And there's lots of comments to continue sharing. Did you have anything to add, Gail, on that one? Sorry? Um, I would just wanted to go back to the previous comment about swabbing. Um, if, I, if I had some lessons learned from River Glen about getting staff to swab, it's about how you set up swabbing and the context that you bring the discussion forward. We did it as a very positive thing at River Glen. It was about keeping our staff and our residents safe. Um, we had a number of donations of things um, that were all individually packaged so we could connect. You know, you got your swab, we made sure that all of the mental health supports were listed and provided at the time you got your swab. And if somebody had donated, um, um, I'm trying to think, there's a number of things there were, but somebody had donated a whole bunch of homemade um, caps that you wear with your uniform. We handed those out at the time of swabbing. We tracked the percentage of people who got swabbed and put up what the other homes in the, in the community were doing. And of course, a little competition, we wanted to be number one. And that was really important to the staff. And so, you know, it became sort of one of those things, oh, you know, we had set times too, that um, the swabbing happens at this time every week. And if, as Jordan said, if people couldn't get there, then there was other um, arrangements sort of made for individuals. But that is, um, you know, just, just to the point about swabbing, um, there's a lot of ways to introduce that. And I would encourage it to be introduced from a positive versus, you know, somebody somewhere downtown decided you must do this. Right. Good reflection. And uh, there's lots of also comments to ask to share your resources. So I'll be connecting with you afterwards to see what can be shared and not shared. So thank you to the three of you, Jordan, Jocelyn, and Gail, for sharing your experiences with us today. Clearly, there was lots of interest, and people really seized the opportunity to ask you lots of questions because uh, there was a real uh, need to learn from what you, uh, what you learned through your experience with River Glen. So thank you. So next steps for our Long-Term Care Plus program, we encourage you to continue to engage with residents and family partners. Uh, if you have an interest in uh, participating in our Long-Term Care Plus program, to fill out the self-assessment tool and identify your improvement objectives and set goals. And then uh, join our next uh, Long-Term Care, uh, join our, register for our Long-Term Care Plus program through uh, the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement website. Uh, phase three is open until December 18th. Which 2020, which uh, provides you access with uh, coaching support and also up to $10,000 in seed funding for each individual home, so retirement home or long-term care facility uh, that participates. And also we encourage you to continue to participate in our virtual learning series and also our national huddles where we get to learn from each other about those best practices that have been implemented throughout the pandemic. Um, and just to give you a highlight, this is our reach across the country so far. So we have representation from every province and one territory, so the Yukon. And we have a total of 256 teams registered so far. And we hope to uh, increase that number of reach across the country so we continue providing uh, some, some additional help across the country as homes uh, manage uh, the resurgence of the COVID-19 virus. 
And so just to give you an, a reminder of future events, so uh, December 10th, uh, we have uh, the final huddle uh, for this year, 2020, hard to believe, uh, where we have some teams who will be just uh, sharing uh, some general reflections of their experience so far. Um, and our next virtual learning series is on January 18th at 12 p.m. Eastern, where we will do a deeper dive uh, with our colleagues here at uh, CFHI and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute on our Essential Together program, which is really looking about changing the conversation around those essential caregivers in uh, presence in the homes. So we hope to see you then. And if you have any questions, please continue to reach out to uh, our either consult our website or reach out to us uh, via email, and there's an email address on the screen. So thank you very much for participating, um, and have a good day. And we ask you to just complete the, web the evaluation after the webinar. So thank you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. You may now disconnect.